It's time to look more deeply into the reasons why those seeking to ramp up the slavery system we have in place are making steady progress, while the rank and file individuals, those not possessing some type of job title or position of public office, find themselves steadily losing ground, with fewer and fewer freedoms remaining with each passing year. We've already determined that because a small number of people cannot effectively dictate to a much larger group based on numerical strength alone, that there has to be a significant level of consent or compliance from the majority in a community for a dictatorship to operate. How is this to be achieved? Initially, it is done by the threat or application of violence on a small number of victims to serve as an example to others who might feel inclined to resist. However, it is wasteful of resources to have to perpetually deal with a stream of dissenters or active resistors. It soon becomes advantageous to convince the bulk of the victims that they are better off not resisting, or even better, that there is nothing inherently wrong or illegitimate with a small group or class exercising dominion over the many. This is a process that has been followed, especially in Western culture, since Magna Carta and even for some time before that. One of the most useful tools in obtaining wholesale acquiescence has been the development of religion, which word in Latin religiare literally means to tie fast or in practice the restriction of the mind. Of course, we find religion to be a major cultural force in virtually every human community. Indeed, it's impossible to name any culture where religious belief of some sort is not a factor in a huge number of lives. In the West, where there has been a movement somewhat duplicitously termed the Enlightenment, religion has lost much of its hold over the masses, but this loosening has been cleverly substituted with the indoctrination of the legitimacy of legislative control. This has been aided by the promulgation of the idea of a steady increasing of the knowledge and wisdom of mankind, to the extent that many are willing to defer the operation of their consciences and the exercise of what is usually termed common sense in favour of those professing to be learned in important matters such as law and governance. Allied to this motive is the concept of concealing important facts or knowledge about the true law of the land and burying that under layer upon layer of legislation or man-made law. Again, it would be difficult to conceal this forever from those inquiring minds motivated by reason and the love of study, so once again there is the fallback position of the use of violence. As George Orwell noted, any dictatorship is reliant upon fraud and force, and once the fraud is exposed, force is the only remaining option. Tacitus expressed the same sentiment a couple of millennia ago. Quote, Crime, once exposed, has no refuge but in audacity. End quote. However, rather than threaten the populace with open naked force, which might well provoke serious armed resistance, the usurpers cleverly direct the attention of their victims elsewhere by continually pointing out the threat posed by the criminal elements of society. The argument runs along the lines of, don't worry about us, we're here to protect you against those who have little or no respect for the law, who would surely harm you were it not for our tireless efforts to protect you from their ravages. You can see how hard we're working at this by the sheer amount of legislation we produce. How reassuring. As Will Keat points out, once people abdicate their responsibility for self-governance, they embark upon the road of an endless stream of legislation aimed at covering every possible infraction of rights that one human may inflict upon another, a road which has no end, given the ceaseless ingenuity of the human mind in concocting frauds and evasions. It's so much easier in the end for each individual to simply honour the natural law and their obligation to behave morally toward each other. I'm going to construct an argument here which is so extreme as to invite ridicule, which is the usual outcome when one pushes an argument to its extremes. Nevertheless, we will see where it leads. One of the most sacred rules of those who would be tyrants is to restrict the ability of their potential victims to resist, 
In most parts of the world, that means very strict gun laws. The most notable exception is, of course, the United States, where, despite the statutes enacted in various states, the people have a federal constitutional right to bear arms in self-defense, and specifically in defense against excesses of government force, the famed Second Amendment. Those in favor of gun laws cite the number of gun-related homicides every year in that country. Indeed, the latest figures show an average of around 19,000 per year for the past five years until 2022, an increase of nearly 3,000 per year, especially in the COVID pandemic era. The gun homicide death rate per 100,000 people in the US is about 10.6, However, it is much lower in the US than it is in many other countries, such as Latin American nations like San Salvador and Venezuela, both in the high 30s, and Colombia, Colombia and Honduras, both in the mid 20s, and much higher than in most other Western nations, which typically average from less than 1% to less than 3%. Of course, these statistics don't show any account of the number of serious crimes or homicides prevented by the prospective perpetrator being confronted or prevented by the appearance of another armed person on the scene. No, the emphasis is entirely upon the threat posed by criminals, especially those armed with lethal weapons and especially those involved in mass shootings. The actual daily rate of gun homicides in the US is about 40 per day. So let me propose a scenario where we insert a crazed lone gunman, not just one, but one for every day of the year, and that these specimens are much more successful than they are in real life and manage to kill 100 victims each. Not only that, but they do this every year for 100 years. How many victims would that be? Well, excluding 25 leap year days in our century of data, that would be 100 times 365 times 100, which equals 3,650,000. An extra 100 gun homicide victims every day, which would be an extra two and a half times as many on a daily average as now occurs, bringing the US rate from 40 per day up to 140 per day. How appalling. Over 100 years, that means the figure of gun homicides in the US would have increased from just under one and a half million, allowing for today's rate to have existed for the past century, to just over five million. Five million, it sounds horrendous, doesn't it? And that's just from one country. Uh, but don't forget, more than three quarters of that five million never happened. I just made them up. And my bullshit scenario is a lot less harmful than the ones we are fed every day by those who want us licking their boots for our suppers. Do we know how many governments, uh, people, how many people governments have killed over the past century? Not exactly, but we can get conservative estimates from a few big players. And then there are all the putzes from the government little leagues. We've got the First World War, about 20 million, including civilians. World War II, 50 to 85 million, including civilians. The Soviet Union, while not at war with anyone else, 20 to 30 million. Communist China, about 35 million. Nationalist China, about 10 million. That's about 150 million, rounding some of those figures down. And that's not counting all the civil wars, some of which, like the US example, wasn't a civil war, but a war waged by one nation against another group of states which had exercised their constitutional right to withdraw from the Union. But that's a topic for a different study. We have to ask the question, how many people would Stalin, Hitler and Mao have killed had their countrymen been armed and able to resist? Which is really the greater evil here? Is it any wonder that governments are constantly pointing their fingers at petty criminals, crying, look over there at those mobsters and drug dealers, or look at the genocide being practiced by those religious fanatics and insane ideologues. We've got to get in there and help out those victims. The point I'm making is that even postulating an insane number of extra murders committed for no reason, governments are responsible for scores, maybe even hundreds of times more killings than the worst efforts of what people normally think of as criminals.
isn't it time we started to realign our definitions of what constitutes criminal behaviour and just which sorts of people are the ones we ought to be seeking to bring to justice? The title of this talk refers to Stalingrad. Stalingrad was the site of probably the most brutal conflict in the Second World War and one which turned the tide of the war in the Allies' favour. However, initially, the Soviet forces were under extreme pressure such that blocking units of troops with machine guns would fire upon Russian soldiers retreating in the face of German firepower. To retreat or surrender was considered treason. The only valid option was to fight to the death. This is the nature at its extremity of physical conflict between competing totalitarian states. Individual human lives are accorded no value at all, apart from what destruction they may inflict upon other human beings. Everything is considered simply as a resource to be used in the battle. Weaponry, ammunition, fuel, food, vehicles, human lives are all just numbers on a chart with only a utilitarian not a humanist value. When people abandon natural law and individual rights and embrace collectivism, engaging in groupthink and doublespeak, harmony and progress are written out of the equation and conflict, initially on an intellectual level, is institutionalised. When the desired outcomes that individuals seek by resorting to the exercise of political coercion fail to materialise, and worse, result in losses of even what was enjoyed beforehand, the inevitable end result, unless enough individuals repent and turn away from that path, is physical conflict, which will eventually devolve into a life or death battle. In the film Enemy at the Gates, set in Stalingrad, one of the Soviet officers, Khrushchev, is given the lines to utter, if we lose this city, the entire country will collapse. I want our boys to raise their heads. I want them to act like they have balls. They've got to stop shitting their pants. That is the choice confronting us all. We can stand up as free individuals while we may, or we can wait until we have no other option than to be ordered into battle at the behest of the next group of would-be tyrants, waiting their turn after the collapse of the current regime. Sometime this perpetual cycle of violence and destruction must end. None of us can do it for everyone else. We can only do it for ourselves and our loved ones. That is what it means to be an individualist. We don't act under the orders of collectivists, but as individuals engaging in voluntary collective action. Thank you for watching.